A very good morning to you in Shagonas. I have just discovered from the comments from this stage that someone who I knew and had the opportunity as a young man to work with from time to time on very many government projects have passed away. And I would like to extend my condolences to the family of Mr. Joe Allard, whose passing represents the end of an era, maybe in the Ministry of Works and in Trinidad and Tobago, mm. because he represented that breed of public servants who knew about service and not self. I had the opportunity of working with Mr. Allard when I was at National Quarries in time and the building of many infrastructural items here in this country, and I'm very saddened at his passing. But he was truly a stalwart of a public servant. So ladies and gentlemen, today we acknowledge his passing at this event and trust that there are many other Joalads in the system who will contribute in the way that he has done. Ladies and gentlemen, while not being surprised, one cannot ignore the fact that as government of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly at this time, we are the target of expectations and commentary. But ladies and gentlemen, for the last 11 years, we have not had surplus revenues to be able to do everything we wanted to do, maybe in the time that we wanted done. The last time we had surpluses on the government budget was in 2008. It's now 2019. From 2009 onwards, we have been managing this country, last government, this government, on a basis of revenues that we collect and borrowing to fund what we want to do. This is relatively a normal state of affairs where governments borrow because you intend to earn in the years ahead so you can borrow and spend and pay and pay your debt and so on. But by the time we got down to 2014, the situation had become very, very difficult because while we were still borrowing, the revenue side had contracted considerably. And therefore, the bottom line in Trinidad and Tobago is that while we may have a million things we we'll want to do, and there are a thousand million claims of what the government should and must do and do now, the bottom line is that management of this country's affairs is a question of apportioning from a smaller pie and doing more with less. We have had to literally juggle around what we have to ensure that all the things that we want to do, we keep on doing them. Maybe not at the same speed or on the same scale, but there are certain things that have to be done. And we have to move our resources from point A to point B to point C to point D to ensure that the national train stays on track, given the circumstances of not being able to fund all that we are able to do. And it's, an, it's in that scenario that you would from time to time hear of shortages here or shortages there. And all I could say to our national community is to let's have the attitude that understands the circumstances. Let's have a can-do attitude, like many households in the country where we do not have everything we need. But whatever we have, we make sure that the children are raised, the fence is up, the door is locked, and there's a roof over our head. And we continue to look forward to each day with boundless faith that tomorrow will be a better day. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a very large public service in Trinidad and Tobago. 
tens of thousands of persons, all of whom have a claim on this revenue stream that I spoke about a minute ago. Let it not be said, other than from those who would say nothing but the truth, that the public service in Trinidad and Tobago has had virtually second call on our revenues. First call is our debt. Because we, we have to pay those who lent us money in the past. Many years ago and all the succeeding years from day one, we have been borrowing and paying and borrowing and paying. And the number one call on whatever money we have is to pay for what we have already spent, the public debt. And as the public debt is being paid, what is left? The next number two item is to make sure that at the end of the month, all those who would have worked would get a paycheck and to be paid. And we have done so, ladies and gentlemen, in a very difficult circumstance. You would hear every now and then, maybe some workers here or some workers there have been paid late. And of course, you know the reaction to that. But ladies and gentlemen, there has been no policy or no arrangement to manage the difficulty by which the solution is to have cut the gazetted public service establishment. Notwithstanding those who might let you hear that, because it sounds good, and many of you believe what you hear because somebody says so, let me tell you now without fear of contradiction, not one public servant in Trinidad and Tobago, a gazetted public servant, has been laid off as a part of any policy to reduce the gazetted public service to manage the government's financial difficulty. Not one. And as for contracted officers, the vast majority are still in post. And ladies and gentlemen, we have created new opportunities as we establish new operations. Those are the facts. But for some people, truth is the enemy. And old talk is the pattern and flavor of the day. So ladies and gentlemen, that being so, we have moved money around in the system. You would hear, we've budgeted $4 million for expenses in the schools to buy the basic needs, soap, toilet paper, and things like that, managed within the school system. Budgeted $4 million, spent so far $3 million. There might be a situation here or there, and wherever it is, whoever is facing the shortage, as far as they're concerned, that is the country's problem today, number one problem. But in the wider scheme of things, we are ensuring that within time, in between time, within the constraints of what we're working with, that everybody gets what is allocated to them. But some small issues can be blown out of proportion to give you the impression that the sky is falling on our head. Ladies and gentlemen, today is a bright and beautiful day. Let me encourage you as a people that even on the day when perfection is not at your doorstep, enjoy the sunlight, enjoy the good day, and don't behave as though you live in a hellhole. Trinidad and Tobago is a beautiful country, and we are doing well in a very difficult circumstance. You only have to compare yourself with others. Compare yourself with others, and you'll understand what our circumstances and how they see us and how they mark our paper. I pick up the paper this morning and Trinidad and Tobago has been given an F by a United States agency that manages or assesses or researches the whole question of the handling of migration into our country. We got an F, they say. Well, if I was marking their paper, what would I give them? 
they have the same problem that we have. Thousands of migrants rushing your border, wanting to come into your country because they see a greener grass on your side than on their side. That is the number one political issue in America. Hundreds of thousands of people and their own people are telling you that those people, some of them, are treated like dogs and cattle. Children are dying on the border. Some of them in cages. 100 people in a room that was made for 10. The temperature is 41 degrees. And of course, they have a bigger military. They got a bigger security system. They got an army, a navy, an air force, and they got a bigger treasury than Trinidad and Tobago. How have they handled their situation better than ours? We, who maintained in this country to the Venezuelans, an open border up until last Monday, where you could come for 90 days and then return to your country. And that is what has been operating in this country from day one. Movement between Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, migration to Trinidad from Venezuela is not new to us in Trinidad and Tobago. Those out of this country might hear that for the first time. But we have had migrations into Trinidad and Tobago from Venezuela when there was difficulty down there, not once, but repeatedly. And of course, we have registered them and opened the door to them in Trinidad and Tobago and said, come forward and be registered. And we'll allow you to work here, even on some of these same projects, if you, if you can find work. Look for work, and if you find work, you can work in Trinidad and Tobago. Turns out, we registered 15,000 people. A little Caribbean nation like Trinidad and Tobago. We have 15,000 Venezuelans authorized now to be within our borders, and we treat them like human beings within Trinidad and Tobago. We get an F. Well, God alone knows what we have to do to get an A. Maybe we have to put a placard in the middle of Caracas saying, come to Trinidad, land of milk and honey, and we'll take care of all of you in Trinidad and Tobago to get an A. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, do not feel beaten down by those who will measure you by an F because we have done more than most countries that manage migrations into their border. <laughs> go to Europe. Go to Europe, the developed world and see what happened to Africans who come into Southern Europe, out of Africa, into, into Italy, into Germany, into France. See what the news says about that. We get an F. Ladies and gentlemen, we mark our own paper, this Trinidad and Tobago, we stand on our own strength, on our own principles, and those who would help. <laughs> History will show that when this circumstance attended us, we, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we were not found wanting. So, they could mark us F, but we know that there are those who will appreciate what we have done, and they will give us a better score. So we ignore that. And I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, in this period of our difficulty, we don't just lap our feet and fold our arms and say, well, we don't have money to do X, Y, Z. We have been doing more in this period to solve the problems, many of them of a longer vintage than those who had resources and time. In the last three and a half years, this government has been solving the country's problems. Because we, and let me not say we, let me speak for myself in this cabinet. I was not elected to get reelected. I was elected to attend to the country's problems. And if by attending to the country's problems, the population decides that what we have done to solve your problems is not to their satisfaction, they know exactly what to do. But I have confidence in you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, that you know and you will see where the problems are being solved. We came into office. We met the Tobago ferry system collapse. We didn't collapse it. We met it collapsed. As a matter of fact, we identified some of those who helped collapse it. Some of them before the court now to answer questions in the courthouse. That never makes the news in Trinidad and Tobago. We had to struggle with vessels that were 
unsuited and could not be certified for a period of time. It didn't last forever. During that difficult period, man, they jumped up and down, wele, 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 wele. We said to you, a day will come when that problem would be solved because the government is solving it. That day has come. There's a ferry in the port of Port of Spain that is as good as or better than any ferry anywhere in the world. That day has come. And that one we have leased. That one we have leased. We have two under construction that we will own. And the first one will arrive here sometime next year when this lease one will then be released back to its owner. In the meantime, between Trinidad and Tobago, the distance has been shortened. Even before we could have leased this one because ferries are not available on shelves, it took us a long time for one like this to become available so that we could lease it. But in the meantime, we were able to buy one that was available, not as good as this one, but we bought it. And when it came to this country in a difficult time, there were people telling you, don't go on the Galleon's Passage, don't use it, don't do that, don't do this, encouraging you to spoil your day. The Galleon Passage has been certified, and except for one trip that has been canceled because of bad weather on the advice of the Met Office, it has made every trip to Tobago back and forth without fanfare, without song. That is what we have done to solve that particular problem. Ladies and gentlemen, this project here this morning is solving another problem. Everybody knows that this central area around Chagones is the fastest growing area in Trinidad and Tobago. It has generated infrastructure problems. It has generated problems that call for attention to the routeways around Chagones. And you ask yourself, what really caused Chaguanas to be this fastest growing area in Trinidad? You might say it's because it's in Central. Well, it was always in Central. It became the fastest area in Trinidad and Tobago because of government's attention to it. You hear them talking now. This morning I'm reading the papers. This morning, some two by four politician this morning telling current people that they have but they have been deprived of the rights of land and money, and some two by four political party is their salvation out of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Chagonas became the fastest growing area. Nine billion dollars of taxpayers' money paid to the benefit of currently workers when that company was closed down. And it was closed down not because anybody hated anybody, but because we had lost our markets for sugar. If what they're saying is true, then we should have had the industry restarted because those same two by four politicians promised to restart the sugar industry, not a cane stock. As they're promising now to restart Petrotrin, as if anybody says that Petrotrin is dead, all we have done is to solve a particular problem. We had a refinery that we owned, that was operated on imported oil largely, that we were buying oil to refine and losing billions of dollars in the process. This country that is struggling to put toilet paper in schools, that is struggling to pay its public debt, they're saying to us we should have committed to losing billions of dollars when there was an alternative. The alternative was to close the refinery, restructure the company, and continue to find a new operator who may have a supply of oil. And if they have their own supply of oil and they want to use our refinery, the refinery is still in point up here. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the stage now where we have received a number of proposals from interested parties to operate the refinery. Only last Thursday, was it was Tuesday, Tuesday, cabinet met on Tuesday. Cabinet took the decision to appoint a fairly large team of specialist people. Some members of the board of Carney, sorry, of Petrotrin, and some significant people with expertise in the private sector and the public sector 
chaired by the, minister, uh, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance to do the final review of the evaluation of those persons who have offered to use the refinery. That team will look at the last 10, the best 10 proposals, analyze all their nuances, and that team will recommend to the cabinet which of those 10 proposals the country should give first preference to. Sometimes in these matters, you might give preference to your number one, but number one doesn't come true in the way you want them to, you go to number two. Number two doesn't come true, you go to number three. We have 10 proposals going to that committee, and in the not too distant future, you will hear that we have found one, and we are entering into an arrangement to have them utilize the refinery, and it will be restarted. And all that will change down there is that the ownership of the refinery, either through lease or sale, has changed. But if they operate the refinery as we expect them to, they will still have to use oil. They will still have to hire people. They will still have to use contractors. They will still have to pay taxes. They will still be an integral part of the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. So how did we solve it? We solve it by taking the burden off the shoulder of the taxpayer of Trinidad and Tobago. And to put in the taxpayer's pocket whatever the new operator has to pay to use the refinery. If that is not a better arrangement, you tell me what is. But of course, there are people in this country who will tell you all kinds of rubbish. Some of them know exactly what they're saying is not true. But of course, as we build roads in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, you're hearing this interesting thing now. The road to Toko from Valencia is an election gimmick. The treating with the roundabout in Chaguanas, where there's gridlock every day, is an election gimmick. But of course, you would not hear them say that these are solving long-standing problems. And interestingly enough, we are doing it at a time when we are not flush with cash. And we are in difficulty by just doing more with less. It is for you, ladies and gentlemen, to decide where your interest lies. As we struggle to make small expenditure, all kind of dotish talk in Trinidad and Tobago. I have been part in Parliament now for, since, I've been in Parliament since 1987, January. My first four years in Parliament, I was in the Senate. When you are in the Senate, you don't make a contribution to a pension because you are not expected to be pensionable. So your, your stipend from the Senate, you get it. If you are elected into the period where you have a constituency of a five-year term and so, there's a pension plan in the parliament. How many of you knew that? How many of you in this room, put your hands up for me, please. How many of you knew that there was a pension plan in the parliament? where members of parliament have to put 6% of their salary in that pension plan. And if you serve for five years, you get a small fraction of pension. If you serve for eight years, you get a bit more. If you serve for 18 or 19 years, you get, and so on, like a normal pension plan. But it's a contributory pension plan. I've been paying into that plan since 1991. Patrick Manning paid into it for over 30 years. And I don't know if he, made a, if he made any claim because he was in office when he passed away. So I don't know that he made any claim on that pension plan for the number of years that he put in there. Trevor Sudama, John Eckstein, Marilyn Gordon, all of these people would have paid into that pension plan. So. The pension plan in this country for parliamentarians falls under a law. Only the parliament could change laws in this country. But you know what I'm hearing from a senior counsel? That the parliamentarians shouldn't touch the pension plan. 
we should leave it to the SRC, the Salary Review Commission. Leave it to a team of people who have no jurisdiction over law. In fact, the most they could do is recommend something to the cabinet. And the cabinet could accept or reject the recommendation. The same cabinet that approved that you go to the parliament and amend the law to improve the pension for persons who are under law, given the requirement to adjust the pension, into which they pay 6% every day. And you listen to all the rah-rah around that because they're trying to stir up your emotion that parliamentarians are doing something wrong and horrible. And the opposition leader, who pays into the plan to you know? Who knows everything I just told you? Hear her story. We should not interfere with the pension for parliamentarians. We should use the money to feed the poor and to diversify the economy. Today, I want to ask the opposition leader, when you were given SIS a billion dollars, a billion dollars of taxpayers' money, don't at Beetham for that project, the contract was awarded at $400 million more than the number two bid. Both contractors qualify for the job. They gave it to SIS at $400 million more than the other contractor. And the day the election took place, and we said in our campaign that we will stop that kind of behavior and we'll go after those who ripped off taxpayers. The day after the election, SIS ran away from this country and left the billion dollar project in there. Cannot be completed. Because now, it costs two billion dollars to finish it. Because it was all about awarding a contract. And that, con that billion dollars was the last billion dollars in the kitty at the NGC. So when you hear the conversations in this country, the only people in this country who tells you the truth is the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And we, and we are doing what we are doing, ensuring that whatever resources are available to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, that those of us in office do not help ourselves to it personally or to our contractor friends. We come down here in Chaguanas and we do phase one, phase two, phase three, solving a problem, not just for the people of Chaguanas, but for all those who pass through central Trinidad and for the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. When we do the same thing to San Grande, to carry the highway into San Grande, so that the people of San Grande cannot spend their afternoons parked up on the, the two-lane road. And we want to bring San Grande into the national economy and to grow the agricultural sector. Because we have just, by way of cabinet decision, taken public servants out of a repo where they were marking time and pretending to be rearing cattle. And we have handed the thousand acres to the private sector to conduct a farm, a real farm, to produce. We've done that. That's on the way right now because we are solving problems. And the road that we're building out there will ensure that the ease of movement around that part of the country will result in economic activity for all of us. We're going from Valencia out to Toko with a road improvement project. I have not heard one person in Kumana or any real Tokonian say they don't want it. I've heard one or two visitors inside there telling Toko people what to do. But ladies and gentlemen, that is par for the course. What we have to do is to make sure that you know the difference between good and bad, truth and old talk. Because Trinidad and Tobago, at this time in our history, is full of old talk. And this is the era this is the era of the internet and Facebook where anybody with a cell phone could generate mayhem in the country. Two weeks ago, some idiot with a cell phone put through that Catholic schools have to be bombed. 15 schools, what was your reaction to that? You can't ignore it. You have to respond to it.
The children were disturbed. Parents were distraught because some idiot decided that was something to do. And worse, there were persons seeking office in this country saw that as a camel to ride in a horse race. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a period when you have to be alert, you have to be aware, and you have to be true to yourself. You have to be true to yourself. And not being aware is not good enough. Don't say, I don't know, and therefore I become available to those to tell me anything they want to tell me. You have a requirement to inform yourself so that you can differentiate between the truth and the lies, between the reasonable and the unreasonable, and also to be able to ensure you make the best of your days and your opportunities and not let those who made a mess of themselves encourage you to smell what they have done for themselves. You look after your own self. You make your day what you have made it. There are those in office opposed to us today who had this country in their hand. And you had to put them out of office because of their behavior. If we behave like that, I invite you, put us out of office. But we don't accept the label that all of we is one. We at this time in this country are saying to you that we are doing more with less. And your dollar is going further in the hands of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And to those on the outside, as you mark us our F, maybe if we had converted our little country, our little paradise, into a refugee camp, as we are being encouraged to do, for a few dollars more, we might have got a grade higher than an F. Ladies and gentlemen, we mark our own papers, and we make sure that Trinidad and Tobago did not become the football of those who believe that because we are small, because we are in the Caribbean, because we are in some difficulty, because the pressures of the Venezuelan situation was upon us, that we would have been directed according to their analysis. In our own parliament, we had the opposition telling us that we must acknowledge President Guaido, and we must do this and we must do that. Trinidad and Tobago did not do that. We went to CARICOM, provided leadership in CARICOM, and took that leadership to the world. Today, the story is changing. We're hoping for the better, and we're hoping the not too distant future, those who have come amongst us for aid and succor, many of them returned to Venezuela in a different time, in a different period. We, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we are not fly-by-night people. We are not short-term people. We don't live for the next election. We don't live for the next day. We live for the future of our children and grandchildren. Those who will use this road, those who will use this town, those who will grow it into a city, and those who will say that regardless of our circumstance, we will continue to have boundless faith in our destiny, and you have that leadership to bring that about. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.